Wow, the, uh, the room's still full after a full day. Um, thank you so much for sticking around. It's really my pleasure uh, to introduce Sir John Scarlett. Uh, Sir John uh, was the chief of the British Secret Intelligence Service, which is MI6, uh, until about eight years ago. Uh, he joined SIS in 1971, and over the next 20 years, uh, served in Nairobi, Paris, twice in Moscow. Uh, as well as several assignments in London covering the Middle East, Africa, Eastern Europe, and the Soviet Union. Uh, second time in Moscow coincided with the end of the USSR, and so has really become one of the leading experts in, uh, in Russia today, and we'll talk about that. And he served for 38 years in the SAS and is now a senior advisor to Morgan Stanley, chairman of the Strategic uh, Advisory Committee at Stat Stato Statoil. Uh, an advisor to Swiss Re, a director of the Times Newspaper Holdings, and chairman of SC Strategy Limited, definitely staying, staying busy. Um, and, uh, and he's also, and we were just talking about this, he's the chairman of Bletchley Park, and we, you know, Sydney and Doran earlier were talking about Alan Turing. I, I'd love to hear a little bit about what you're doing out at Bletchley Park uh, these days. <coughs> Well, I won't take up uh, too much uh, time, thanks very much, uh, on it, of course, but um, uh, I've been chairman of the trustees of Bletchley Park for um, six, seven years, and understandably, if you're in, if associated with a place like that, you become sort of quite passionately interested in it. Um, it's, uh, it's a sort of no-brainer, as far as I'm concerned, um, is probably the most successful intelligence collection operation ever. I think that's more or less accepted you know, universally. It was an astounding success. Uh, it was, of course, a technology success, with, which moved very rapidly from modest beginnings to, I mean, two or 300 people working there in 1939. Uh, by January 1945, there were 10,000 people uh, working there. And uh, there was more or less total coverage of uh, key strategic and uh, political and military communications of the enemy. <clears throat> uh, and that was a technology success. Alan Turing was one of the key people involved, but you know there were others who get much less recognition uh, now. And for 30 years, nobody even knew about it. Uh, and then it became publicly uh, not, uh, you know, aware, people became aware in the mid-1970s. And now, of course, there are films and Benedict Cumberbatch and so on. And no, no doubt most people have seen it. And the films are great. They, they're very good for our visitor numbers. Uh, and uh, and you know, I'm very keen to encourage uh, visitors up there. We never have disappointed visitors. And easy to get. I think this, my mic. My mic I'm just failed. Sorry, do I need a mic? No, it's okay. Back up this, I think. We've got a backup. Um, an easy, easy 40 minutes from, from London. Too. Well, uh, the do I need a mic on? No, no, you're good. Do, do, um, well, the reason why uh, Bletchley Park is where it is, is in a country house uh, that went on the market and was bought in early 1938 by my predecessor, as Chief of the Service, Admiral Sinclair, and it was bought uh, apparently by his own money for six thousand pounds, fifty-five acres, uh, um, and uh, it was it was bought because it was a safe base and a safe haven away from London for when the bombing began, and therefore they bu they bought it to be deliberately near the railway line hmm. next to Bletchley Station, uh, and it still is near uh, the Bletchley Station, so that is very good for visitors, and uh, uh, you it takes forty minutes uh, from Euston to Bletchley, and it's three minutes walk from the station to the park. Well, you, you are now the second person to encourage me to go there. Um, John Graham Cumming, our CTO, uh, is very passionate about that and actually led the campaign to get the apology from Gordon Brown for the British government's uh, treatment. If you haven't read that story, it's, it's, a, it's a really great story. I, I'd love to talk to you about you know, your experience and how, how you see the world uh, today. Um, you know, you've watched you were, you, were, you were doing on the ground human intelligence through the Cold War and otherwise. We've spent a bunch of time talking today, earlier today, with Sir David and otherwise about how, how computers have changed and, and the internet has changed the intelligence industry. Is there still a role for human intelligence in, in a time when we're putting all of our data on Facebook and, and everything is flowing through, through cables that someone like GCHQ can be picking up on? <coughs> Well, um, uh, everything, of course, you know, if you are dealing with real secrets, 
uh, at the heart of sophisticated government machines, uh, then you don't have it flowing through cables. Or if you do, uh, it's you know, very heavily uh, protected, and then you're into a sophisticated uh, game. Uh, and uh, it, we just talked about Bletchley. In 1945, after the colossal strategic success of what happened there, uh, it was quite widely thought that the future of intelligence would be in technology and interception, and it wouldn't be, you know, we didn't need uh, human sources. Uh, and that was 75 years ago, uh, and throughout my entire career, we sure needed um, uh, human sources. The reality is, it's a mixture of the, of the two. 95% uh, of what you get and what you need may come from uh, technology, uh, and as I said, that goes back a long way. Um, uh, but it, the 5% uh, where you have to go to human beings, because you know, they still can, uh, th that, that can be the difference between, uh, uh, between success or failure. Um, I just draw attention here, it's not really a technology point, but also I'm just a reminder of the value of human uh, intelligence. Um, uh, there's just recently been a book published in um, 1983, the nuclear war scare of November 1983. It's called 1983, The World of the Brink. And that is a case, so I happen to know about it, that is a case where a, a, a human intelligence source uh, in the heart of the KGB was the first that we learned that you know, over a period of a few days that we were living through at the time, there was belief in the Politburo in Moscow that US and NATO were about to launch a nuclear first strike under cover of a NATO command and control exercise. Uh, we, and we could not have known about, and you know, it was very sophisticated communications then, we could not have learned about that precise point from technology. And we wouldn't now either. Has the, has the pendulum swung too far? Are we still training great spies? Um, <clears throat> well, of course, I'm biased. But uh, really, I'm exceptionally proud to have led my service. And it's a wonderful organization. Yeah. So when you were at, in your career, you, I mean, you saw the, the rise and then the fall of the, the Soviet Union for, for a lot of your career in the field, you know, the, the, the adversary was clear. Mm. Uh, and then with the fall of the Soviet Union, um, it seemed like we were shifting to a world of these non-state actors, the yeah. Al Qaeda's uh, of the world and, and other terrorist organizations. And now I, I don't know what to make of where the threat is coming from. What's, what's your perspective on where we, where we are in that, in that cycle and, and where we're headed? Well, I think it's, you know, it's important to say that although, of course, in the Cold War, uh, there was the fundamental superpower crash, if you like, between the US and allies and the Soviet Union, it wasn't just the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, there were many other issues uh, that, uh, that people had to spend uh, their time on and working within the service and so on. It had nothing to do, really, with, uh, with the Soviet Union. So it's important to keep that in perspective. But it's, it's true what you say, uh, that we did move and we... You know, once the crash had happened of the Soviet Union, that is the collapse has happened, we suddenly and unexpectedly found ourselves in this new situation, then of course we did think we were living in a completely revolutionary time. And uh, the sort of unthinkable had happened, nobody had predicted it, whatever they might claim now. I was around at the time, I know, that nobody predicted it. What, what was that, at the time, what was that, what was that like? Like, to, I mean, what, what was the... How, how did the surprise manifest itself within within MI6 or 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 the other intelligence agencies? Well, in an intelligence sense, uh, which was quite a sort of narrow professional, um, you know, part of what was a huge uh, global um, event. Uh, you know, we saw uh, an opposition, if you like, an enemy, really, um, uh, that we had worked against uh, for decades. We saw it uh, changing, apparently changing fundamentally, more or less straight away uh, and rapidly. And so, of course, uh, we had to think carefully and but energetically about our new 
national and service um, objectives and clearly um, and sensibly uh, we wanted the best possible relationship with um, the new Russian Federation. Did, did, did you, I, I mean, I'd imagine you had counterparts that were in yes. Russia. Yes. How did your relationship change with those, those individuals? Well, I got to know them, yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and I, I enjoyed it very much. Are you still a friend? I mean, do you, do you go get drinks together? Or? Well, that, that is slightly more complicated than that. And I, <laughs> and I, and I but I know, you know, I, um, I, I do have, um, uh, you know, friends and, and, uh, uh, and good contacts and very much respect um, uh, their abilities and, uh, and understand what they went through. And how in, I mean, Russia obviously is, is in the news very much uh, in terms of trying to influence uh, political processes ar ar around the world. How much is there a contiguous line from the people that were, that were fighting the Cold War to today? Or, or, and, and how similar are the strategies between those, those two those two periods of time? Well, it's a good, it's a good question, um, uh, that. Uh, I, you know, it's, when you have a complicated uh, issue and problem and a demanding set of challenges like we obviously have now in relations with the Russian Federation, uh, you cannot understand that unless you know the history. It's a sort of fundamental point. If you're really to understand this kind of situation, almost any sort of political, uh, geopolitical situation, uh, you need to know the history. And when you see mistakes being made, it's usually because you know, the people making them don't understand the historical context. And it's self-evidently important um, uh, when we are now dealing with the Russian Federation that we understand what uh, the, the leadership, for example, um, uh, who are you know, in the early 60s or whatever, of a sort of generation that was brought up in the Soviet Union in, the early, in their early days would have been part of the bureaucracy mainly. Uh, and, you know, what they experienced and went through, I mean, they might have prospered almost immediately, but uh, many of them didn't. Uh, and there was huge insecurity, uh, families, material circumstances, and uh, lives and prospects changed often overnight through absolutely no fault of their own. Uh, and, and there was also a sense of national humiliation. It was very, very important. Mm. Uh, that because, you know, one minute you were a superpower and you were told that you were living in the most wonderful country that ever existed. There wasn't exactly free debate um, about it. And the next minute, it wasn't there. And, and you had no preparation for it mentally, uh, and uh, and in, you can see now uh, that that particularly manifests itself in the great desire to be seen as equal to the United States. And so, what is you look at how Russia is in the the news today? What, what is it that you think isn't getting covered as well in terms of understanding that history and understanding that perspective? Is there a, is there a, a moment where you you want to reach out to whoever is the commentator on the television and say, you, know, you don't understand the perspective that they're, they're coming from? Well, I quite often think that, and I often think that that isn't, uh, that isn't the case. Uh, they don't understand. I also think you know, things tend to get exaggerated. So, of course, everybody knows that uh, President Putin was a KGB officer. Well, there are hundreds and thousands of KGB officers. You know, it, it, it was a very common uh, thing. And, um, you know, he was perfectly respectable career, but you know, he, the idea that somehow or another his behavior and thinking is dominated by his time in the KGB is very, very misleading. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm, I'm trying, you know, I do, I am tempted sometimes to... Throw your shoe at the Well, TV yes, but, I, but um, I don't do that. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and I don't ring up journalists and tell oh, them... I worry that, your shoe no. has a razor blade or something <laughs> no, no, in it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't. But you know, there, there we are. It's uh, you ask you ask the question. You know, what did I feel? Well, the, the the answer is, of course, someone like me and people like me who had worked in order to limit uh, Soviet espionage, to uh, limit Soviet expansionism, who fundamentally didn't agree with that model of society, and of course worked to protect our own uh, national security and, and freedoms. Uh, of course, on the one hand, the collapse of the opposition, of course, you could see, you know, well, yeah, we won that. Um, on the other hand, if you lived there and you saw the personal consequences of that collapse, 
and you understood it was there were very very powerful edge elements of tragedy about it. What would, what, it, what would be your advice to uh, if if you are advising uh, policymakers today uh, to to do especially with respect to Russia and how and 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 how that situation is developing? Well, um, I don't know. You know. It, Honestly, it's, it's easy to think you know the right way forward, but you know, I know from experience that you usually don't, and when you're actually there having to take the decisions in fast time, it's very demanding. Uh, um, but I, I think sort of basic, you need to be clear, and the good decision makers are clear about basic principles. And two basic principles, which I think do apply here. Uh, one is make sure you know, don't go around complaining about being attacked and so on if you don't make the effort and spend the money uh, and have the skills to defend yourself. So have good defenses, mm -hmm. uh, the best you can possibly have, uh, and just make sure you know what's going on. So if you're going to talk about you know, being subject to attack, a technical attack or whatever, uh, you do everything you can to protect yourself. And why shouldn't you? If you live in a country like this, you're perfectly capable of, um, of doing that. Um, that's one fundamental thing. And then the second fundamental thing, uh, but it makes it sound easy, it isn't, uh, is make sure that you're, you're talking, make sure that you've got your channels open. Don't go into isolation. Uh, make sure you've got the relationships um, because you can't ignore it. You can't pretend it isn't there. Uh, and uh, the, um, the kind of thing which nearly went wrong in 1983 was because people weren't talking to each other. Hmm. So maybe, maybe one of the Trumps inviting Russia back into the, into the G8, maybe not completely crazy? Well, I hesitate to comment on that. No, no, no comment is a perfectly good answer. So it, it seems, you know, the thing that's been striking you know, and, and at least in the news coverage has been that, at least on the, the attacks in, that appear to have some sort of Russian origin, uh, that appear to be involved in, in the Brexit uh, uh, vote, uh, potentially appear to be involved in the Catalonian separatist movement, um, obviously the US election, there's been a lot of coverage. It, it, it almost doesn't feel like the goal was to support one side or another, but to really delegitimize the process of democracy in these, in these, in these parts of the, of the world as well. And that feels like a new strategy. I, is, that, is that a new strategy um, for, for the Russians to be, to be if, that's, if that is in fact what they're trying to do? Or is that something that, that you were seeing even back in Cold War days? Mm. Well, it's another good question. And actually, it's another thing that one has to remi uh, remember. It goes, goes back to the point about thinking about history. Uh, uh, of course, you know, in the Cold War, uh, uh, an absolutely under underlying feature of the Cold War was ideological competition. And so automatically, uh, you know, each side, if you like, had an interest in uh, um, discrediting uh, the, um, the values and systems and political structures and government structures of the other side. And that was certainly um, an objective um, throughout the existence of the Soviet Union and uh, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and so on. And during the 1920s, 1930s, and yes, in the post-war period, it, you know, it had quite a lot of success. Uh, by the time um, you know, I, I, I came on the scene, and of course I'm very young, so that was recent. You know, uh, the, by the time I came on the scene, the, you know, when I look back on it in retrospect, I can see that that had changed, and they were being much less effective in the propaganda sense. That they were much less on the offensive, uh, and uh, there was a much stronger sense of um, self-confidence and values, if you like, in the liberal uh, democracies. And was that that? Was that that they got worse at propaganda, or that the defenses against propaganda got better? Which I, I ask because then the the question is. Um, is this something, you know, once we're now aware that maybe Facebook ads are getting manipulated by foreign agents, that, that maybe that blunts the effectiveness of them? Well, we used to worry about the, even in the 70s and 80s, 80s we used to worry about the effectiveness of the propaganda. But again, looking back on it, uh, I can see really with the wisdom of hindsight that it was useless, most of it, and it didn't have any effect at all, or very, very limited effect. Uh, 
and uh, um, so you know the, the ideological level that one uh, was uh, definitely uh, one if you like um, but it was but it was there and it was a feature and a lot of effort went into trying to counter it uh, uh, now you know we still are learning about it um, a lot of what you talk about just now is new uh, people are very quick to have opinions about you know how successful it is, not successful, what particular events you can attribute, uh, let's say, to that kind of interference, um, US elections or the referendum or, or, or whatever it may be. But I, I, I think it's very difficult to link cause and effect. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm still very cautious, however much I might know or think I know about what actually happened on a day-by-day -day basis and trolls and and um, the Internet Research Agency and uh, uh, the, the range of activity across, you know, however many states, 21 states um, in the United States during the election, um, linking that and saying yes, and for this reason and in this way, that made a difference to the results, much more difficult. Uh, and we still don't really understand, I don't think, uh, yeah, although, how you know, it, it is, works. It, it, it almost seems like a particularly effective strategy if, if, again, all you're trying to do is undermine confidence, because once you make it so that there's even a doubt around elections, that, yeah. makes, that makes democracy much harder to, to really thrive and, and survive. There's, there, there has to be an integrity to elections in order for them to Well, have, okay, that's, that's, that's fair enough. Uh, but remember, Western liberal democracies have a great talent for messing up themselves. And, and uh, you know, US politics, is quite effective at that, and and, and uh, the partisan. And, and right now, it seems like British politics are a little. Well, uh, it, yeah, our politics are, are not uh, straightforward, of course. Um, uh, although I'm sure everybody here understands them perfectly well, and and uh, and indeed, um, you know, in the French presidential election. Um, the sort of the, the hammer blow, which came from the sort of the backyard, as it were, um, uh, which really had the most effect on the result, uh, came against one of the people who were well disposed towards Russia. Yeah. The, yeah, you know, so it doesn't always work like that. It seems like there's no better transition to then talking about Brexit. One of the <laughs> we could talk about GDPR too, but um, <laughs> with. With Brexit, you know, a lot of what, you know, the, the UK has had such a strong relationship with the rest of Europe in the intelligence community traditionally, how, how, do, you, how, how do you think about, what's, there, what's sort of the bull case and the bear case around how, how Brexit might change that? Well, of course, you know, in the, in the bear case, in the worst case, um, there are a number of ways in which you could have a negative and detrimental effect. Um, uh, and as usual in this kind of uh, area, uh, you know, it's the detail which is really important. So people can make big statements about how you know, it, our, our security is not affected, is not put at risk, and everything is done on a bilateral basis, or it really revolves around uh, the five eyes and so on. And a lot of that is true, uh, but. Um, and I have written about this, and I don't normally write about things, but I've written about this, and actually before the referendum, just that the, uh, and it's even more true now, uh, a huge amount of very valuable work is done through um, databases and instant data exchange, which increasingly is on a pan-European or EU level, uh, in the, particularly in the counter-terrorism field, of course, especially in the counter-terrorism field. And, um, uh, and, uh, and that's just growing and growing and growing. But that has to happen within a legal structure. It can't just happen operationally. And that legal structure, understandably, is um, an EU legal structure. And so if we're going to remain uh, really serious contributors and beneficiaries of uh, those databases and, and security systems, then we have to work out you know, how to be part of it and part of the legal thing. And that's quite complicated. And uh, that is being worked on at the moment. And Prime Minister made a big speech at the Munich Security Conference back in February where she highlighted that, talked about it, and she did it deliberately. I mean, that was one of her biggest statements that she's made on the whole, um, the whole issue. So it's the detail that matters. But she, most people don't know about that. Hmm. Is, they should. Um, so you have to pardon my ignorance as a, as a, as a naive American. 
But as I look at one of the as I look at the challenges of Brexit, we've had a lot of people talk about this, and we literally outline what are potential national security challenges. Um, it, it, again, my naive perspective is that one of the great benefits of a constitutional monarchy is you've got a monarch. Is there is there a, is there some way out of this that that literally is the queen intervening in in Brexit? <laughs> Makes a lot of sense at some level. To the naive American over here. Um, uh, no. <laughs> Fair enough. So I'm going to open it up to to questions. But um, uh, before I do, I have to ask a question. I'm sure nobody has ever asked you before, which is uh, which is your favorite Bond. <laughs> Well, I'm going to give you a boring answer that if you, of course, it's the most successful film series of all time, uh, one of the most successful sort of novel uh, series of all time, written by Ian Fleming, who did work in uh, uh, British intelligence, naval intelligence uh, during the war, did have professional um, association uh, with it, um, did know that there was such an organization as MI6, which most people didn't know, uh, which is where it comes from. And of course, that's where the brand name comes from. It's thanks to, I mean, it's thanks to him, really. Uh, and, uh, and but at the same time, you know, I'm going to answer the question by saying I don't really have one because, you know, I, I, I want, you know, instinctively, I want to protect the integrity and the reality and reputation of the profession and of the service. And I mean, it's nothing to do with James Bond. <laughs> Sorry. That's, again, yeah. the naive American. No, here. but I'll say it is very exciting and the adrenaline pumps around, but not like that. Yeah. <laughs> I think there was a question over here. As someone who worked for MI6 for quite a while, what do you think these days is the best way to stay up to date with what's happening in the world and actually uh, understand what's going on, considering that a lot of new sources these days can be manipulated and it is. Like, I'm Russian myself. I know what is translated to the public by news sources uh, in Russia and what is translated here. And I understand that the truth is somewhere, I guess, in between. So I just wanted to know your opinion about it. Um, yeah, I don't think the truth is somewhere in between, actually, um, uh, often uh, in, in, in that case. But you, it's a, it's of course, it's a very good question. Uh, there has been just a complete explosion of data and of information. Uh, and, uh, and that has happened, that's happening now, you know, it happens, as we know, month by month by month. Uh, and, uh, of course, I mean, that is actually, I often think, that is almost the most important feature uh, that we have to adapt to, uh, because then that data is flowing into our decision-making systems and our ana analytical systems and everything else, uh, and uh, our ability simply to absorb it. Um, and to uh, understand it and then put it into some kind of sense is under challenge the whole time. So um, you you have to have the you have to have the capacity. Um, well, first of all, you have to have the capacity not just to get you know the special and the additional information which I talked about at the beginning, you know, which is what you're there for. Uh, at the end of the day, if you're the secret intelligence service, you're there to collect secret intelligence. If it's not secret, you shouldn't be doing it. Somebody else will do it. And it's quite important to you know, focus on what matters uh, for you. Uh, and so you've got to be good at that. Uh, but then, of course, you have to be part of a system. It doesn't have to be you yourself, but you have to be part of a system which um, is able to absorb, understand, make sense of, uh, put into context and all the rest of it, um, the data which is out there in all sorts of forms, you know, largely in sort of open source and non-secret uh, uh, form. Uh, and then you can make sense, hopefully, of the, um, of the extra special stuff that you might have. Um, so analytical capability is extremely important. Now, analytical capability only works uh, if you have a basically honest, open culture. It, you, you have to be part of, of, a, of a, an overall society culture, in my experience, which is open and 
free speaking and you know it just rests on an absolutely solid uh, legal basis uh, and uh, to the maximum extent possible is not vulnerable to manipulation uh, by whatever source it might be uh, and then your own your own structure and your own organization has to be uh, honest and um, people must be able to speak freely of course in a disciplined control you know way of course otherwise you <laughs> everything goes haywire but uh, still, the culture must be one of openness and of free speech. I believe very strongly in that. That's my entire sort of experience. And um, it was my experience, um, you know, by and large, in fact, almost always within, within the service. Now, if you have that uh, culture and in your own organization, within your own government structure generally, and then in wider society, then you have the maximum chance of uh, coming to the right you know, out, out, outline and the right conclusion with a much more demanding sort of data mass than used to be uh, used to be the case but you have to start as far as possible with a sort of an objective mind i mean nobody is completely objective everybody has you know, a certain set of ideas to start with uh, but i've you know I, i'm pretty satisfied that you know i saw honest work going on you know all, all, all the time really people were honest um you know by and large, you know, and were open about what they did and, and uh, reported properly and subject to proper discipline and, uh, um, you know, behaving, understood the, the law and all the rest of it. Um, and it's amazing what you can get done if you get all those things right. And of course, that means you could have a really good people. So you've got to be, you know, choosing your people very, very carefully. Is, yeah. Just to make it very tactical, so gone a bit, yeah. is there, having seen behind the curtain and now and then and seeing how that's been covered are there news sources or places that you look to that generally seem to get it more right than wrong or, or things what what do you read in the morning uh and what would you recommend people here who, who really want to get an unbiased perspective read? yeah well that's a good question too um and, and of course um you know i do i, I don't any longer work in that world, and I don't have access to you know, all the stuff that I used to see. Uh, and um, so you have to learn for yourself, and you have to make judgments. And there's a huge amount of um, good information and analysis um, out there in the open media. There's also also an awful lot of rubbish, uh, and so you have to understand how to how to manage that. Um, but by and large. You know, and you can make your own judgment. You can make your own judgment, but there are certain well-established, um, serious media organisations, uh, for example, that just have a, the kind of culture, basically, that I'm talking about. It's never quite going to be as good as what I was just saying, I suppose, but it, it's still, it, it can be there. And you can tell over a period of time whether their, you know, their media coverage and analysis is, um, is honest or, or not, or is not biased. Um, and, uh, and then, in my case, you know, I, I select that, I, I, a small part of what I, I, I actually have access to, of course, and, um, and then that helps to inform me. And if I want deeper analysis about something, you know, I don't know, let's take an example. If I can just, you know, I want to understand how um, the uh, chairman of the um, Communist Party of North Korea actually really thinks, you know, what what influences his thinking, how does he, what's in his mind, uh, then, then, you know, I'll, uh, I'd have to go to a, a particular specialist, probably, a, you know, a very good research center or think tank or something, and to go to somebody who I knew was, was good and knew what they were talking about. Um, so you can get these things combined. Uh, that's the best advice I can give. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Sir John Scarlett. It's a real pleasure. Thank you for the service to the